Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite recipes uh, for macaroni and cheese. This recipe is from Kenji Lopez Alt's Food Lab, his, his book. Uh, you can also find it on uh, Serious Eats website. This, this recipe is fantastic. I just love it. We use it all the time. Uh, it makes such a great macaroni and cheese, but what I really love about it is that it uses some fun chemical tricks uh, to, to get your cheese sauce to be just the way you need it to be. Okay, first let's talk about that cheese a little bit. All right, when I make macaroni and cheese, I love to use cheddar. Cheddar has such a great flavor but it is really tricky to use. It's really tricky to turn into a sauce. And the reason for that is that when cheddar melts, you've got two issues with it. It gets really kind of gritty and clumpy, and it also gets oily. All right, so that's a big problem when you're trying to make a sauce. And the reason why that happens is, is twofold. One is that the fats in cheddar cheese melt before sort of the solid protein that makes up the cheese structure uh, before that solid protein melts. Okay, so your fats are turning into a liquid before your proteins, and so you get that greasy kind of um, orangey ooze on top of your cheddar as you try to cook it. All right, because the fats leach out so quickly, uh, the, the proteins start to clump together. That's helped a little bit by the amount of calcium that's in cheddar, uh, but it's a big problem. One of the things that you will see for cheeses that melt really well into and turn into sauces is that they have a low melting point. The proteins in those fats have a low melting point. And so I've grabbed these protein melting points, uh, these cheese melting points from On Food and Cooking, the great book by Harold McGee. And you can see that jack cheese, uh, the proteins melt at 130 Cheddar, it's at 150, and Parmesan is at 180. But all the fats melt at one at at 90 degrees. Okay, and there are other cheeses like Gruyere and other Emmentaler uh, that have lower melting points as well that people often put into into cheese. And so you can see, sort of illustrated here, uh, what happens when our fats melt before our proteins. But if we can control how those fats melt and separate, um control how the fats melt, how they separate, not how they melt so much, the temperature that they melt, but control how they separate from those proteins before the proteins melt, then we're in, in good shape. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through and show you how I make this, uh, this mac and cheese, and, and then we'll get into some of the science of it. Okay, so we're going to start off by adding our pasta to a pot. We're going to add some cold water to it just right on top. What we're looking for here is to get just the right amount of water to hydrate our pasta. Okay, and then we're going to move on to making our sauce while we boil that pasta as it cooks and gets ready. So the first thing we got to do is we got to add a, uh, a, an egg and scramble it up. This recipe typically calls for two eggs, but since we're at an egg shortage right now, I'm only using one. Okay, so we put in some, uh, some egg scrambled up, add some evaporated milk and then add some seasoning. And these can be seasonings, whatever you like. So I'm gonna use some, uh, some brown mustard here, some spicy brown mustard, uh, and a little bit of cayenne. My kids don't like super heavy, uh, super strong flavors. I add lots of my seasoning after the fact, so they don't have to deal with my palate. They can, they can change things on their own. Okay, so after our pasta has cooked and soaked up all that water, we're gonna add some butter, get that butter good and melted, and once it's melted and sort of coated the pasta all over the place, uh, that, that butter really helps with getting the, the pasta ready to, to soak up some sauce and to interact really well with the sauce. So I'm gonna melt that butter, and then I'm gonna pour in my egg and evaporated milk mixture. I'm gonna heat that up a little bit. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start adding cheese. Um, I'm adding a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of cheese here, cheddar and jack, a mix of it. Um, this recipe calls for a pound of cheddar and a half pound of jack cheese. Uh, so I'm just going to mix it all. And, and I'm going to stir it real quickly too. If you are making macaroni and cheese using a roux and making a thickened sauce that way, you have to be really careful with how you add your cheese to that sauce to get it all mixed up. And so we need to look out for that. But in this recipe, we can add as much cheese as quickly as we want. 
And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna make sure the cheese gets all incorporated into the sauce that we're making and we're gonna let it all melt too. And so that's what we're watching here too at the very end is just watching that cheese as it melts. And so once it's melty, once it's the consistency that you want, you're all done. All in all, this process takes about 20 minutes between cooking the pasta and, uh, and, and putting everything together. Okay, so let's look a little bit at our recipe and, and talk about each part of the recipe and what's going on. All right, so we're gonna look here first at, at step number two, cooking the pasta in boiling water and draining. And one of the things I'm gonna do in the lectures from here on out is, is talk about each part of the recipe and really look at, at what's going on instead of focusing more, uh, more specifically on a single part on a single chemical process. So in this part, all right, we're gonna look at the, the talk about what happens when we boil pasta. Okay, so when we boil pasta, we are hydrating the starches in our pasta. Starch, the, the pasta is flour and egg, and so we need to soften that up. We need to hydrate our pasta. Uh, I've shared a research paper here that shows the hydration, kinetics, how long it takes to hydrate our pasta to where we want um, to really get at uh, an al dente pasta, what we're looking for is about 30% water in our pasta, right? So if we have one gram of pasta, we want um, 0.3 grams of water to go into that pasta. And so depending on what temperature you're cooking at, it takes a little longer to do that. But we can go and, and search out some of these really uh, food-based scientific studies to, to look at what's going on as we're cooking our pasta. The next step I'm gonna talk about is adding our butter uh, and mix until melted. Okay, our butter, uh, it's gonna add its own texture to the sauce uh, by melting that butter onto the pasta. Uh, the, the, the butter helps the sauce to, to take up the sauce. The butter is also in itself a water and oil emulsion, and it helps to emulsify some of the extra water that's remaining there on that pasta. All right. Um, I'm gonna skip back now to the first step. All right, the first part of this recipe is after you've got your cheese uh, to coat it with cornstarch. Okay, so I took my cheese and I grated it and then I tossed it in cornstarch. If you buy pre-shredded cheese from the grocery store, that has already been coated in cornstarch. One of the reasons that uh, makers do that is because it helps to keep those strands of cheese from clumping together. And we're gonna use that same reasoning uh, in, our, in making our macaroni and cheese here. We wanna keep those strands of cheese from clumping together as we try to cook it. All right, so that being said, uh, there's usually better flavor in the unshredded cheese and the blocks of cheese than there is in the, the pre-shredded bags. But the pre-shredded bags of cheese are super convenient for making this recipe. So let's look at the science of what's happening here. There are two things that are going on. The first, again, is that we are coating uh, our cheeses in cornstarch, these little tiny crystals of, of cornstarch. Uh, you can see that here in the, the top image, okay? And that prevents the, the cheese from, the, each strand of cheese from clumping with whatever other strand of cheese is near it. We want to keep that from happening as we're making our sauce. Okay, the other thing that the cornstarch does is it's going to help thicken our sauce. When you make pudding, right, you add cornstarch to milk and heat it up until that cornstarch swells and thickens your sauce. We're doing the same thing here uh, with our cornstarch that's, that's surrounding our, um, uh, our cheese strands, right? And so at about 70 degrees is where that, that cornstarch will really expand and hydrate. Um, and, and we get uh, thickening of our sauce. I should also say that the pasta, as you're cooking it, also puts out some starches that are going to thicken and add a really nice creaminess to your sauce as well. The next thing I want to look at in this recipe is our evaporated milk. So evaporated milk has two parts which are gonna be helpful to our sauce making. Um, the first part is carrageenan. Carrageenan itself is a hydrocolloid, much like cornstarch. It will help thicken our sauce. The other part that uh, evaporated milk has are, it has lots of milk proteins, right? These protein micelles that go into normally making cheese. But when you're using evaporated milk and using it in this sauce, these proteins help to emulsify our cheese oil. 
as it's melting. It keeps that oil from separating. And so these, these micelles, these proteins, these casein proteins are really great to have around in excess supply because they help keep our fats from separating uh, and, and making a pool of, of greasy liquid. Okay, so if you look at cheese structure in general, these casein proteins that I've shown over here are what normally make up the solid cheese structure. So it's like having that melted protein already before your fats melt. And so that really helps in keeping your fats stable and keeping them from separating. The other really important part here are the eggs. All right, and so eggs uh, for a number of reasons. First, Eggs contain, the egg yolks contain a molecule called lecithin. Lecithin is an, a natural emulsifier. It's going to help blend uh, fats and water. And so that also helps to keep our fats from, uh, from separating out as they melt early. The other thing our eggs are going to be doing is they're going to help to make a custard. Right, and so a custard, just like in ice cream or in scrambled eggs or in creme brulee or anything like that, and so the egg proteins are going to make this nice custard around our milk fat, and so we talked about that in a previous lecture, and we can see different temperatures at which that happens. Uh, the final thing I'm going to talk about here is flavor, and we'll do it based off of two contexts. The first context that we'll look at is uh, top notes, middle notes, and base notes. Our base note for this, the most heavy note, the, the, the most flavorful note is really the cheese. And I've, um, I've highlighted some molecules in our sharp cheddar cheese that are really going to play a role here. But that's our base note. The middle note we're using here uh, are the eggs, the evaporated milk, and whatever seasoning you want to use, right? You have lots of options. Um, the recipe calls for hot sauce and mustard. I use mustard and cayenne. But you can use whatever you want here as your middle note. Now, what this recipe doesn't add are top notes. And there are lots of options you have, you have to add here. And this recipe really needs some top notes because it's super heavy, right? So you really need to brighten it up somehow. So you can use chives or parsley or some other fresh herb to really uh, lighten up this dish. If we look at it, uh, the recipe in terms of flavor from salt, fat, acid, and heat, we get our salt from the salt that we add and, and the cheese. Our fats come from the cheese, the evaporated milk, and the butter. And we get lots of acid from the hot sauce as well that we use. The heat, we don't really use heat to generate new flavors, but if we add hot sauce, if we add cayenne, we can add heat in terms of uh, flavor temperature. All right, so that's all I got today. Um, I really highly suggest Kenji's book. Please go out and buy it if you enjoy cooking. Uh, it's a great book to have, tons of, of really good science, tons of good scientific method in thinking about how we make our food. So go buy his book. Um, if you have any questions or comments or want to chat about any of this, please feel free to reach out. I hope everyone is well and comfortable and healthy.